How does intermittent fasting affect alcohol metabolism? And how does alcohol consumption affect intermittent fasting and your overall results? Well, I'm gonna do a deep dive on this. I'm gonna talk about how alcohol is actually metabolized, all the different enzymatic functions from soup to nuts, A to Z. I'm gonna give you a breakdown so you know what's happening in your body. And then I'm gonna circle it back to talk about how it intertwines with fasting and how you can start utilizing some different tactics, but also how you can truly understand and appreciate the amount of effort that goes in to simply processing alcohol and how it can affect fasting. Now, if you haven't already, please make sure you hit that subscribe button. And if you're already subscribed, you have to turn on those notifications notifications so you know whenever I post a new video, but also whenever I go live and do my Q&As. All right, let's talk about this. So first and foremost, before I go into anything, I do want to say this for those that have a short attention span and just want to get to the gist of it. Alcohol does break a fast. Alcohol contains seven calories, which means there is a strong metabolic response within the body to process alcohol. It will break a fast. So when we look at it, we actually have to remember that alcohol is almost like the other macronutrient. Remember the old campaigns for pork, the other white meat? Well, I would almost argue that alcohol is the other macronutrient. Protein has four calories per gram, fats have nine calories per gram, carbs have four calories per gram, and woohoo, here comes good old alcohol with seven calories per gram. There's a lot of enzymatic functions, it's still metabolized, it does break a fast. But I don't know who would wanna really break a fast with alcohol in the first place. So let's get down to the science, let's talk about how this actually works. All right, so as soon as you consume alcohol, it begins being broken down in your body through something known as alcohol dehydrogenase. Now, alcohol dehydrogenase is a simple thing. Just like the name implies, it takes away hydrogen atoms. So it ends up breaking down by breaking apart the hydrogens. So it does this pretty simply. It does it as soon as it hits the mouth, and it does this as soon as the alcohol hits the stomach. And then from there, the alcohol, which is now partially broken down, travels through very, very small capillaries throughout the entirety of your liver. I'm talking every nook and cranny. Remember, the liver is made up of lots of small micro capillaries so that it can filter things. So when it comes down to it, we are getting alcohol into every portion of our liver so that our liver can handle it. Then our liver uses two enzymes to break the alcohol down even further. It uses, again, our friend alcohol dehydrogenase to begin breaking the alcohol down into something known as acetaldehyde. Here's the thing, acetaldehyde is about 30 times more toxic than alcohol. So you might be wondering, why does the body take something that's already toxic and make it even more hepatoxic? Well, the answer is simple. It's a smaller molecule. It's a less complex breakdown. So even though it's more toxic, it's easier for the liver to handle. The point is, you don't want this acetaldehyde in your system for very long. You want your liver to be able to handle it at a moment's notice and be able to take it out of your system before it does some serious damage. So that's where the second enzyme comes in, something known as aldehyde dehydrogenase. This aldehyde dehydrogenase's job is to break down the acetaldehyde. So it just basically does what the alcohol dehydrogenase did, just one step further. Further breaks down even more hydrogen atoms so that this acetaldehyde, this very toxic substance, can be broken down very efficiently. And it's broken down into something that's rather harmless called acetate. And then this acetate is broken down into good old fashioned water and CO2. So yeah, it's pretty complex. It's amazing that the body can take alcohol, something so toxic, and through a series of enzymatic functions in the liver, actually turn it in to water and carbon dioxide. Pretty amazing. But then it goes one step further, okay? We know how it's actually processed in the liver, but it actually does some other things. You see, there's one very specific enzyme. This enzyme is called cytochrome P450. And I know it sounds like something out of Star Wars, but it's not. Cytochrome P450 is a specific enzyme that breaks down alcohol in an entirely different way. And cytochrome P450 is only really active in those that drink regularly. So if you're someone that drinks every night, or maybe you're just on a binge at one specific point in time, you're going to have elevated amounts of cytochrome P450. Here's the scary thing though. Cytochrome P450 changes how our body looks at alcohol altogether. Rather than just this metabolism being isolated into the liver, the cytochrome P450 starts making alcohol metabolized in a different substrate of the cell, which means it actually becomes somewhat more of our DNA meaning our cells are adapting to breaking down alcohol because we're consuming so much of it, which is kind of scary and what we have to be cognizant of. Okay, so that's cytochrome, but there's another enzyme too, one known as catalase. Catalase is the one that's under a lot of scrutiny by researchers right now. What catalase does is it takes this alcohol and breaks it down also into acetaldehyde, but it combines it with other enzymes so that it can get into the brain. So catalase is sort of this carrier of acetaldehyde into the brain which could contribute to the impairment, could contribute to why you get some of the psychological effects of alcohol, 
But even more importantly, it allows this acetaldehyde, this very toxic compound, to combine with neurotransmitters in your brain to ultimately create something known as tetrahydroisoquinolines, also known as TIQs. These TIQs are interesting components that are created in the brain that may contribute to addiction. So when we create TIQs, we actually allow our brain to become more addicted to alcohol, simply because they're combining with neurotransmitters and they're becoming part of our standard electrical functions within the brain. Okay, I don't wanna spend a whole lot of time on that because it's a whole separate story. But let's talk about glutathione really fast too. Okay, this is something I'm gonna touch on briefly. Glutathione is our body's natural antioxidant, right? So whenever we consume alcohol, our liver processes all of this, these enzymes break it down, and then we have something called glutathione, which comes in and neutralizes some of the poison, okay? And then glutathione comes in, it's already in our body, it neutralizes the poison. And it does this by donating an electron. So basically, if you have a pool of glutathione, they all have spare electrons. They donate an electron that ultimately neutralizes the electrical charge of a poison. Eventually, those glutathione stores run out. Now, when your glutathione stores run out, that's when you feel groggy. That's the hangover effect. Okay, so that's something that we have to pay attention to. Now we start the link to fasting. First and foremost, fasting restores your glutathione levels. So fasting can actually allow you to recover from alcohol significantly better. So those old days of after a night of drinking where you have to eat some big greasy breakfast, no. It's quite the opposite. You actually want to be fasting so that your glutathione stores can be elevated and your body can detox. But let's talk about this really quick. When you are fasting, your body is not consuming any food. You're not having any kind of nutrients coming in. You're actually having to rely on your body's own stores. This means that something called the pyloric valve, which is a valve between your stomach and your small intestine, is wide open. This pyloric valve is what allows food into the small intestine when you're ready to consume food, when you're ready to actually absorb nutrients. When you are full, the pyloric valve closes. When that valve closes, food is not getting into the small intestine. Well, what does this have to do with fasting and alcohol? Well, our stomach has a few feet of surface area, a few feet of surface area to actually absorb nutrients. Our small intestines, because of the structure in the villi, actually have thousands of square feet of surface area, even though it's only so many feet long. Because of the structure, it has a lot of surface area. That surface area means that you can absorb alcohol very fast. So your pyloric valve is open when you're fasting. So it means alcohol that you're consuming is gonna go right into your small intestine and get your blood alcohol level very high, very fast. Some of you might be saying, well, this is a good thing, it makes me a cheap date. Not really, I mean, yes, but the thing is, it's gonna get so much alcohol in your body so fast that those enzymes I talked about, the alcohol dehydrogenase, the aldehyde dehydrogenase, the cytochrome P450, and of course the catalase, aren't going to be able to keep up. So what does that mean? That means that your liver now has to prioritize the metabolism of alcohol above all else. Because it ran out of enzymes, the liver is now preoccupied with handling this other macronutrient known as alcohol, which means the other food that you consume has to take a back seat. It doesn't get processed. The fatty acids don't get broken down, the triglycerides don't get broken down as efficiently because your body is on high alert to manage the acetaldehyde, to manage the alcohol. So all those awesome effects, all those awesome effects of spiking the insulin and getting the right carbohydrates in, getting the right protein in at the end of a fast, you go out the window. I'm not saying that you have to live a totally square life and never drink alcohol. In fact, I'm gonna give you some feedback here. But you do wanna make sure that you're probably watching your alcohol consumption on your fasting days, even if it is after breaking a fast, simply because you are already in a situation where your body's going to assimilate the alcohol much, much easier. Now, of course, we also have to talk briefly about how alcohol negatively affects the central nervous system. Alcohol slows down catecholamine responses. It slows down cortisol, it slows down adrenaline. That's why your reflexes are so poor when you're impaired. Now, if you've seen my other videos talking about how fasting actually literally burns fat, a lot of it is through noradrenaline and adrenaline, catecholamines that are created by the adrenals that are ultimately part of our central nervous system. So a lot of the fat burning and positive effect of fasting in the first place comes from central nervous system stimulation and a really well-oiled machine when it comes down to your CNS. So you're really negating the effects of it by consuming alcohol, even if it's after breaking a fast. Last but not least, if you are going to consume alcohol, 
you do want to do it after having a small amount of carbohydrates. Okay, a small amount, because what that's going to do is it's going to start to close the pyloric valve, but it's also going to put some glycogen into the liver. This glycogen effect in the liver is going to allow the liver to combine glycogen along with this acetaldehyde for a softer absorption and actually buffers the liver a little bit. But don't get me wrong, you don't want to be consuming a ton of carbohydrates. I'm talking like 20 or 30 grams. Okay, and the big question that people are probably wondering is what alcohol should you consider drinking? Okay, I don't want to go on another tangent here, but I'm going to break it down briefly. Alcohol is not a clean process to be made, okay? A lot of times there are a lot of preservatives, a lot of congeners, a lot of other things that are added into it. And the distillation process isn't always as clean as we like it to be. So whenever possible, triple distilled or quadruple distilled alcohols, whenever possible. Gin, vodka, things like that. Make it much, much easier and much healthier, okay? Also, make sure you're not drinking wines that have a bunch of sulfites or anything like that. Those are additional metabolites. Those are things that require a secondary process by the liver, which means that the liver, again, has to process the acetaldehyde first, then the sulfites, then the preservatives, and then all these other things. Your body is not going to feel good, and it's not going to thank you. So keep it clean whenever possible, and keep it on a non-fasting day. I know that was a big in-depth breakdown, but I hope it helped clear some things up. And as always, keep it locked in here on my channel. I'll see you in the next video.